I'm Luke Ranieri. I'm a content creator. And, uh, well, you can find pretty much anything that's most relevant to the things I do at LukeRanieri.com. I have a couple YouTube channels, Scorpio Martianus, in which I, I talk in Latin. I make content that's all in Latin and ancient Greek. And I have my other channel, Polymathy, where I talk in English, often about Latin and ancient Greek. That seems to be what a lot of my um, followers are interested in. But I also make videos about space and technology and other languages besides Latin and ancient Greek. Um, and I make audiobooks as well. So those are the things I do. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and don't don't be shy. We know that you also love pop culture and video games, which is another reason oh, why you're here. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> What's Absolutely. your favorite video game? Um, well, now, that's an interesting thing. I haven't admitted this in the uh, YouTube videos where I talked about Latin and ancient Greek in the video games, but I haven't played those games except for looking at them a little bit. Um, nor have I really had the time for any since Myth the Fallen Lords, uh, which I played through the early and mid-2000s, if you have even heard of that one. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so I unfortunately uh, am, although I've seen a lot of these games, and I really would like to get uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey just so I could take images and use them for like comprehensible input where I describe like, you know, temples and stuff in Latin or ancient Greek, which would be wonderful. Sadly, I have not uh, um, re, uh, reacquired the bug of enjoying video games for a long time. So um, uh, for, forgive my the disappointing news. Oh no, it's not disappointing. This is uh, this is an opportunity to evangelize Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is one of my favorite games ever. I went to Greece. I was amazed at how accurate like everything was placed. Like if you've been to mm. Athens and you're like the Temple of Hephaestus should be over here, and this is what the Parthenon looks like yeah. from this angle, and they recreate it really really accurately it's almost scary so mm. it's a really fun thing to do if you just maybe you don't want to play the game maybe you just want to run around ancient greece highly recommend it very, i would very like fun. for that yeah <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into learning ancient greek and latin because you don't just read it you speak it fluently which not a lot of mm. people can say yeah my latin's fluent um quite comfortable actually it's in some ways a lot better than my italian which is also totally fluent for uh, living in the country. Um, but um, that's just because I put so much time with it for, you know, better part of 15 years in Italian a bit, but not nearly as much. Uh, ancient Greek, meanwhile, it's very difficult to get the same kind of fluency simply because there's so little material, but that's a lot of things I create, like um, most of the content I create is on Patreon in Ancient Greek, uh, as well as Latin for, uh, you know, for this exact purpose. For all of um, the uh, people who follow me to get the chance to get to hear a lot of easy to intermediate ancient Greek, as well as for me to improve my own skills. So um, there are a few um, speakers that are fluent of ancient Greek in the world, but far fewer. There's, I estimate about 20,000 Latin fluent speakers, ancient Greek thousand-ish uh, at best, probably maybe fewer, 500, uh, but increasing because there's some great schools out there and there's some great content, which is starting to um, increase the number of uh, really good fluent speakers, which is cool. Um, yeah, I guess you asked like how I got started, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, how did I get? So I uh, was in Florence in 2005. Uh, I was, uh, what was I, so yeah, sophomore the first semester in college. And I was, um, actually I came to Rome like, and I got to see you know, these wonderful buildings, all the inscriptions that were in Latin, right in the Roman Forum. And I was amazed. You know, I spent, you know, pretty, most of my time in the ancient part of Rome. Rome has everything, you know, has the uh, ancient stuff from 2000 years ago. It has <clears throat> medieval buildings. It has a lot of Renaissance architecture. So at all these periods, but I was most moved by um, the continuity of Latin inscriptions, which you could see in the, like St. Peter's Basilica, for example, which is what, 16th, 15th, 16th century, right? Um, depending on, you know, when it was started and finished and, uh, all the way back to, you know, a couple thousand years before that. So was, I found that really interesting and I saw Latin as this almost sister language, obviously the parent language of, of Italian, therefore something that I wanted to learn since I was there at the time to learn Italian. So then I found the wonderful book, um, Familia Romana, which is the first part of the Lingua Latina Peste Illustrata series. I have the second one part two with me, and this is the part two, and these are some, these are some of the best books ever created ever uh, because they use um, all, there's no, you start with the first, um, so the very first chapter with nothing at all, um, uh, except 
Roma in Italia est. Rome is in Italy. It's that simple. And you go from that to poetry to the super advanced uh, stuff in literature with as these pictures and marginal notes. It's just amazing. It's a and, cool and, this, and yeah, th this is a uh, an illustration of a famous uh, painting, who's I can't remember the painter, but it's. Um, the uh, Sabine women stop the war between the Sabine men and the Romans because the uh, the Romans they stole all the Sabine women they made them their wives and then the it's this actually really amazing moment and I have a video which is in Latin on Scorpio Martianus where um, I I laud this exact thing and the background of my video is in my my uh, studio which I'm not in at the moment um, I have uh, which you've probably seen it, it says Guirites on there in the background right on the yeah uh, left side. It. it's cool yeah and uh it's there in greek and latin and I, it's basically something i realized a couple realized a couple years ago that the this was a name that the renaissance people were who were reviving latin in a, even more actively than the middle ages folks were doing which was also very very active and uh they were uh, lorenzo valla who was um uh, he was ta talking about how he was talking about how um, all Latin speakers of our day, being you know a few hundred years ago, can be called Quirites. What's a what are what's a Quiris? What are Quirites? Um, that was a name that Romans gave themselves in peacetime when they weren't like in, in military or abroad. Like Romanus was sort of the generic or like more military term, but Quirites, Quiris singular, uh, is the term for the more peaceful side. And the reason is that um, when the Sabines were stolen. Um, Sabine women were stolen by the Romans through a complete, um, they, the Romans put on these games. Um, and this is back when Rome, Romulus was around. They, Romulus got the city expanded by inviting all the, like basically uh, uh, like kind of Statue of Liberty, you're, you're, you're poor, you're criminally insane. Basically everybody from Italy just come to Rome because we need people to start building buildings. And they're like, huh, we have no women. Let's in. And then they tried to, they went to all the towns uh, the way that Livy, the historian describes this is hilarious. They went to these towns and they just push them away. And they say, are you kidding me? We're not going to marry our wives up to you? Who the heck are you people? You're a bunch of criminals. <laughs> well, they stay true to that. And they um, say, hey, we're making these games. And the Sabines and some other tribes came. Um, and they, right in the middle of one of the games, Romulus gives the signal. And then they all... Um, grab all the Sabine women that they can, and they kick out all the men from the city, out of the walls. Um, now this leads over the course of a year or so uh, to the Sabines pl plotting revenge and war with the Romans, and then they come back and do it. And then it's gonna be, that's the Sabine War, the first Sabine War. But what happens right before these two armies, which are pretty uh, comparable, clash, which, you know, if they're comparable, there means there's gonna be a lot of casualties. The Sabine women come out of the Roman uh, city's walls and in that, like in that picture, and they, um, and this is, you know, legend or whatever, but it's, it's attested by historians. And then they um, come between them and they say, if you, say, they're saying, because on one line they're saying, father, don't, don't do this. This is your son, you know, brother, don't, this is your, you know, your, your, um, your uh, nephew. And then they, they say to their, you know, husbands for over a year, don't kill my father, don't kill my brother. And so I think I found it to be such a really interesting um, uh, moment. Now what happens then is that the city of Rome, Roma, and the city where the Sabines lived, which is called Curae, the Roma Romanus, Roman, Curae Quiris, or Quirites. So the two cities were joined together like, I don't know, St. Paul and Minneapolis. The main government was kept in Rome. But as a kind of concession to the Sabines making this joint um, federation of two, two cities, is that the Romans would call themselves also Quirite. So everyone was a, Quir a Quiris and everyone was a Romanus. And the, they, then they, and the name of peace for the Romans was this Quiris. And I found it to be really a powerful image because when studying a lot of this ancient stuff, there's war, there's bloodshed, there's, poor, I mean, even that very act. It's called the rape of the Sabines from the Latin verb rapare, which means to steal. And which is, you know, it's used as we understand what that means. So um, out of something that's clearly horrible, as in many aspects of human history have been, we build on top of that. And what I, uh, I found inspiring about it is we learn about this. We're using this language of these, you know, um, uh, Metatron, if you know him, just did a video about were the Romans evil, which I thought was very interesting. And he analyzes it from the perspective of all the brutality they, they did 
was this brutality normal for their time? How would we judge it from our society? I found it very interesting. But the point is that what we take out of the past, um, when it's literature and poetry, these amazing things, we don't ignore all the bad stuff, but um, we acknowledge that we can turn, as the Romans did with the Sabines, something that was truly heinous and wrong, and I think by our judgment, evil, into something good and peaceful. And I found that, and with the Sabine women themselves, with their power of peace, like um, Gustav Holst's uh, um, Venus Bringer of Peace, if you know the, the melody. Yes. Um, as opposed to Mars Bringer of War. Um, I found it to be really powerful and really, I'm going to use significativo, which is Italian, meaningful for why we study Latin and ancient Greek, because these folks, just like so many others, uh, their culture had, their society, shall we say, perhaps not their culture, which is maybe the nice part. Society had all this rough stuff. Can we separate it? How do we do that? So anyway, that was, you got me talking about that little image. That, no, I love yeah. your enthusiasm for history. And I think that's the same reason that I study ancient uh, cultures is because of that sort of profound, these kind of profound stories that are part history based, part mythological, but sometimes have a theme or something to take away that's mm. hugely important. And I think that's why, particularly for me, at least, I love ancient Greek. You know, I hesitate mm. to say mythology because really this is something that people believed in. This is a real active ancient religion and culture and it's fascinating partly because it's so almost foreign to us it's a part of our history and mm -hmm. that sort of segues into the idea that people are so fascinated by ancient greece and rome that it continuously pops up in pop culture and particularly right now video games where you have everything from god of war to hades to assassin's creed odyssey to kid icarus i mean people love ancient greece and then you've got rise son of rome and civilization and total war and all these other games that cover ancient rome but i have noticed that i am not the only one who struggles to figure out how to pronounce some of these names which is why you're here because i thought it'd be super fun to see if we could get closer to how to pronounce these names and i sort of divvied them up into categories to make it easier for everyone to follow along so they can jump to timestamps and be like i want to know how to say the name of this greek god or i want to know how to say the name of this hero hero we'll talk about that in a second in the you know the iliad and the mm. odyssey um because mm. it's a lot of fun and when i do history and games research i try to be very careful about acknowledging like i know this is not how you would really pronounce an ancient greek and you know ancient latin and i was looking the whole reason i found your channel was i was looking for someone who knew how to pronounce ancient greek because even trying to listen to modern greek it's it's hard for me to pick up on things and i know it wouldn't be the same as modern Greek. Now, of course, ancient Greek, as in one of your videos on ancient Greek, you know, mentions and points out that, you know, ancient Greek wasn't static. It evolved over time and it depended on like when you were. So for me, a lot of stuff I'm interested in is like fifth century BCE Greece, but that would be maybe different from Alexander the Great's time or Agamemnon's time. So it does come with yeah. that ca caveat. I know you know that, but I'm also trying to get ahead of anyone who's like, well, technically, you know, it's, you can only pronounce it this way. We know. <laughs> but I, uh, I, think this I, just, would be I just did a rant video about that exact thing last week. I saw that. I saw your awesome rant video on how to pronounce Caesar. And it made me feel better knowing that, you know what, if we, if we use our American or British accents to pronounce ancient Greek names, that's okay. That's just how we it's just how we heard it growing up. We I don't have know. to, you know, none of these people are going to come tromping into our living room and take offense. The angry dead are not going to come back and eventually. Yeah, should we call it honest. Deutschland instead of Germany? I mean, uh, yeah, how, ex exactly. How far are we going to go? Are we going to call it Nihon instead of Japan? I mean, <laughs> okay. Mm. All right. So, speaking of languages, let's just jump into the, we're going to start with my favorite, the Greek pantheon. Hmm of gods. And mm. I've slid in a couple of gods that aren't technically part of the locked in 12 that we've come to know because over the course of centuries, some gods were kicked out of the 12, some were brought in, some are minor and yet still significant. They pop up over and over again. And I asked some of my followers about names that they wanted uh, to have included. So I, I slid those in as well. But to be fair to the Greek gods, I decided to put this in alphabetical order. 
so we can start start strong and end strong with Aphrodite and Zeus. I thought that was cool. a really good bookend. So we'll play. We're gonna play a little game called Tomato Tomato, and I'll tell you the way that I would pronounce it in American English, and then you tell me what you think a fifth century Greek would probably say. So we're gonna start off with the gorgeous goddess of love and beauty. I would say Aphrodite. You might say. Fifth century BC, um, Aphrodite, 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 uh, Ap Aphrodite. So what's going on there? So the letter um, that we write is PH, transcribe. It's transcribe PH because when the Romans came in contact with the Greeks, um, they heard the sound P, which is that letter we call it phi or phi, and it looks like a circle with a vertical line through it. Um, so that symbol in that time period, um, which would be, it's pretty good for most of ancient Greek until, say, the first, second century BC, AD, where we start to see some changes. But for the most part, what the Romans were hearing was pa, pa. Now, as native English speakers, when we say, uh, I don't know, pan, if we even, and anyone out there can do this little ex experiment, um, if we uh, say pan, you can feel that air pan. jets comes out. But if we say span, span, much less. Span. And they could, yeah. Yeah. Because the P is no longer the first letter of the word. As uh, English speakers, this is all true, also true of Germanic, uh, German speakers and a few other Germanic languages, that whenever we have a pataka, that's at the beginning of a, a, fr a word, um, or before a stressed syllable like apparently, so pakata, we have to add what's called aspiration, a bit of air onto it, a little like an H sound, pa. Be uh, because if we don't do it, like if I could speak, I'm going to speak in sort of a a fake, uh, I don't know, Spanish sounding accent. If we want to, be, want to speak with that sort of accent, we say pat, pan, we say pa, pa. Oh, that's, we can kind of understand that, but it sounds kind of like ba or pa, but neither at the same time, because we're used to hearing that. So that's what it is, that's that aspiration, that pa sound. Uh, so like in, um, um, in uh, aprodite, aprodite, so pra, pra, pra. Um, and that changes in the first, classical Roman period, depending on the speaker, more and more from the first, second centuries AD to becoming a bilabial fricative fa, which is the same as like Fuji, like Japanese fa. So Aphrodite, Aphrodite, Aphrodite. And then the delta also starts to become a fricative as well, a little bit like Spanish the, the, or like you know, have the same sound in English. So Aphrodite, Aphrodite, Aphrodite. And then the changes into modern Greek pronunciations from there. Wow, that's really fascinating because it, it does, there's definitely a difference between 5th century BCE Greek and then hundreds of years later, it gets that sort of softer sound until it yeah. becomes the modern Greek. So you can really mm. see the evolution of that. Yeah. Aphrodite in modern Greek. Yes, beautiful. Okay, so we're going to go on from beautiful girl to beautiful guy. Um, he is the god of prophecy and enlightenment and uh, purification, but he can also send plagues with his arrows. Uh, I've been to his temple in Delphi. It's amazing. But I would say Apollo, the Greeks might say. Apollon. And that's an example, too, where the uh, romanization of it also changes the spelling. Uh, so Apollo, it ends with just an O and not the N. Because yeah. Latin, yeah, Latin and Greek have a lot in common. They have a lot of words that end with this. Let me use it in um, the possessive form, the no form in sort of Japanese. So if it were when it's possessive in Greek, it's Apollonos of Apollo. In Latin, it's Apollonis. So it's this. You, there's an N in there. Now, when you're just saying the name, like Apollo does this, Apollo does that. Latin does Apollo, but Greek does Apollon, and that final n sound is retained in Greek, but removed in Latin. So like Plato in Greek is Platon. So Plato, Latin, but Platon. They get rid of it because Latin just does that anyway. And it's just normal not to have the n sound in what's it's called the nominative case. It's like kind of like the ga version if it were Japanese. So right. like, um, so like Aporoga, Aporonga, whatever it would be, Apollo, Latin, but Apollon uh, in Greek. Um, yeah, there you go. And then the geminated L, La, just like Italian and um, Japanese has some geminated consonants. Uh, 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 is not one of them. But um, the uh, the sound of uh, la, so Apollo, 
that would be another characteristic which isn't retained in modern greek that is really interesting because i did that one i didn't know so i learned something new already this is this is fantastic i don't see that all yeah. right um so we're going to move on to our next god who originally wasn't from greece he was from i don't know if you pronounce it thrace or thrakia but he is the god of war i would say Ares. but someone in fifth century bce greece might run around saying Ares. 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 that's a much prettier way to say it nah they're all pretty i think Ares sounds they all sound, i mean but authenticity <laughs> is something else. That's um, true. Of course, a modern Greek would say Ares sounds terrible because they say Aris. Um, because so, uh, that's sort of the, what's so interesting about it, it. Subjectivity, subjective preferences aesthetically are not wrong. That is to say, you, you uh, thought that Ares sounds prettier. Yes. A modern Greek thinks that Aris sounds prettier. Yes. What's interesting is that people will then, um, and we find this a lot with modern Greeks. In fact, I, I'm going to have a video coming out soon where I gently take them down a peg uh, because they'll insist that their pronunciations are the right ones on things without any thought to ancient pronunciation variation or internationalization of their words. Like I say the word iota because that's what the letter is called in English. And there's, and I just had to read some comments today about me saying, well, it's not Yota, it's Yota, not Iota. And it's like, no. So anyway, so that's just to say that um, the subjectivity is not wrong at all. And you, and you can absolutely prefer Ares. And why do you prefer it? It's 5th century BC and therefore cool. Um, something that's really interesting about Greek from the distant ancient past to the modern days has the sound that's a retracted S. You've heard me talk about that in some videos, yes, maybe. Yes, I have. And this, so that's really cool. It's a sensitive, it's lower pitch. That's a very Greeky sound. Ares. The letter eta, which is the E sound, is open in the fifth century BC Attic. E, Ares. But that closes to Ares by classical Roman times and Aris in the modern language. There you go. Yeah, I, I just, I was just saying that I prefer the the, the Greek, modern Greek, and classic Greek are just such cool languages. And so the, the way they say it is just, ah, it's, I love it. Oh, I do too, yeah. It's yeah. fantastic. Mm -hmm. And another fantastic god, or goddess in this case that we have, is she's interesting because she does almost double duty sometimes as a very maternal goddess, but also the virgin goddess of the hunt. I would say Artemis, but in 5th century BCE Greece, they might say... Artemis. Artemis. Almost Artemis. the same. Almost the same, like... yeah. Yeah, we truly are. Um, so, and then the letter iota is i, and then the sigma is um, Artemis. Artemis. Very cool. Okay, yeah. another cool goddess. She is also a god of war, but she steams more on the tactical side. She's all powerful, and a whole city is named after her. I'd say Athena, but the Greeks might say fifth century um, Athene. 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 Now, Athene. Uh, now, later, the uh, pronunciation of theta, which Monogu is called theta, um, the cha that changes to um, Athene, Athene, which is also seems to be, this is so interesting because, you know, the Spartans already made that change. And the Attic playwrights, like the comedians, would make fun of Doric speakers, the Doric dialect of ancient Greek, the, Spar the Spartiate dialect, um, their accent, because they wouldn't say Athene, they would say Athene, and they would write it with the letter sigma, because th, like if you think of a French accent, they say z, z, imagination, you know, they say z, or z, or something, because they don't have a th or the, like we do in English. So the um, Athenians approximated the accent by writing it with the letter s, or sigma. Um, so they would, so you would see like uh, Athene, but it's meant to be Athene. Anyway, that's the idea. So, um, um, but that pronunciation then becomes dominant hundreds of years later. Anyway, so go figure. Go ahead. Oh no, you know you got me thinking because that is something I've always wondered while I'm writing historical fiction about fifth century BCE is how the Athenians and the Spartans had different dialects, and so it would be. You know, so I always wondered what a Doric accent would sound like to an Athenian. Is it like a country bumpkin thing? Is it like 
a Cockney accent to them. I always wondered because people forget that even in ancient mm. Greece, all these different city states had a lot of them had their own dialect and accents, and we sort of forget that. And it gets lost sometimes when you read these uh, comedic plays from fifth century BC Greece. And you're like, yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> Partly because some of it is like inside jokes about how different Sparta and Athens were, not just politically. Um, mm. And in terms of just, uh, their whole culture was was different. So I like that yeah. you kind of touched on that. Yeah. And I often think about that. Um, what does this accent or what was the feeling of it? And there are some definitely distinctly uh, rustic things, but it sound like, I don't know. Um, well, interestingly, um, Doric, which is what that region, like the Lacedaemon, like a, like a, like a daemon, um, the region which contains uh, Sparta, that uh, accent or dialect Doric, it's compared to the Scots language. So the uh, so Scots, which have, um, developed from Old and Middle English in parallel with Modern English, is sometimes intelligible and sometimes not. It's not the Scottish accent, which is also very beautiful, but the Scottish language, um, which is sometimes called dialect, but it's, it's definitely a language, I, in my opinion, although it's barely a scientific definition. Uh, it's called Doric. And the proper London, you know, RP is referred to as attic. It was a very old fashioned terms. Um, and there, it was used derisively, I, as I understand it from, I don't know, some hundreds of, hundreds of years to deride the Scots language as being an inferior, like version of English or something when it's just, you know, there's no inferior language, it's just language. Uh, to call it Doric, the less prestigious of the dialects in the classical world of Greece. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting and good Good to keep in mind. So yeah. we went from Athena to we're going to go to this is one of the oldest gods in the Greek pantheon. So far as I can tell in my research, there is evidence that she existed nearly 3000 years ago and is a goddess of agriculture and honors and also a thonic or chthonic goddess. I might say Demeter, but someone in 5th century BCE might say Demeter, Demeter. Yeah, uh, spelled cool. pretty much the same. Yeah, spelled like that. And the letter eta three times, Demeter. Um, eh, open eh sound. Closing later to Demeter in later Hellenic, Classical, Roman, Greek, and then Minor Greek, uh, Demeter. Very cool. Okay, speaking of cool, everyone's favorite party god, I would say Dionysus. But someone in ancient Greece who's had a lot of wine mixed with water, of course, because, you know, the Greeks were very snobby about the fact that they did not drink their wine neat, but I would say Dionysus, they might slur. Dionysos. Dionysos. Oh, that's very different. Yeah, and the pitch accent is a really important part of um, ancient Greek, which is just like Japanese has pitch accent. Ancient Greek has pitch... Or, yeah, what is it? yeah, just like Japanese has pitch accent, ancient Greek has pitch accent. And the systems are very similar. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I actually, I wonder if you have the same book I do. I meant to bring it down to show you, but I actually read that in a, an ancient language book about how mm. ancient Greece or ancient Greek is a lot like Japanese because it's pitch accent, exactly. which is really fascinating to me. So that's yeah. very cool. Let's move on then to, now he is not part of the traditional Olympic 12, but he is a huge part of the ancient Greek religion and we all see him eventually. I might say Hades, but someone in 5th century BCE Greece might say... Hades, 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 Hades. Mm -hmm. and Hades, 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 modern. So the H changes mm. over time. H go, yeah, the H, um, depend, there, were, there were dialects even back in pre-classical times, like the 6th century, um, the Aeolic dialect of Sappho, where that H had already disappeared. Yet, it's also retained, even through the Byzantine times, in certain accents and dialects. Um, as is the H sound of Latin retained into, you know, in some places into the um, medieval world. Which is why we use the H in English. Because there was a memory of it, meaning huh. Otherwise, they would have invented a different symbol to mean H, if it was truly lost in the ancient world. That's very cool that it stayed with us all this time. And we're going to keep with the H's. Uh, there's another possibly ancient god, um, Hephaestus, but in ancient Greece they might say. Where's the accent? Hep yeah, Hephaestos. 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 Wow, that Hephaestos. is very different from Hephaestus. That's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, hephaistos. Mm-hmm. Hephaistos. And the pa becomes fa later. Hephaistos. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Now, it's, here is a very ancient goddess as well. She is queen of heaven and Zeus's wife. I would say Hera, but... Hera. Hera. Oh, okay. So it's close. It is. Hera. That's very cool. It's, that's really pretty. Okay. And then we're going to move on to a god who had a double function as a messenger god, but also he led the dead to the underworld. I might say Hermes, but an ancient Greek might say... Hermes. 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 Mm -hmm. Hermes. So the pitch yeah. accent is Hermes. It's, yes. It's... Um, the high pitch is on the, so it's a long vowel, e, eh, so it's a little bit, what's a good, um, like, um, sensei, the se, Hermes. Hermes. Yeah, sensei, Hermes. Hermes. It would be the same pitch contour as sensei. All right, that's really cool. Um, mm. And then another goddess who kind of got kicked off of Olympus, even though she was super important to the everyday lives of the ancient Greeks. Uh, I would say Hestia. Are we close because of that he sound? Absolutely. Hestia. Hestia. The pitch accents on the E. Hestia. Um, so Hestia. 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 Yeah. Hestia. There you go. Okay, cool. Now I'm I'm cheating a little bit because this isn't this is a very minor god in the Greek pantheon. He's not even part of the twelve, but he is part of video game lore. So I snuck this one in. Everybody says the god of war, Kratos. But it would probably be Kratos power. Kratos, Kratos. yeah. Which is an appropriate like, name for that very overpowered character. It's a fantastic. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah, and um, Pankratikos. Uh, Pankratikos is Greek for pan, all, and Kratikos is powerful, so all powerful. And it's even used idiomatically in Latin as well to say Pankratike Valio, which means I am well in in every every way. It's like saying I'm super awesome. Oh, that's really cool. I see I'm learning yeah. so much today. This is great. All right. And we're going to move on to a character who did appear in God of War. I think she appeared in the Ghost of Sparta PSP game back in the day. But she is also popular as sort of a representative of the spring rebirth. And she is the reluctant wife of Hades. I'd say Persephone. But what would the ancient Greeks say? Because I feel like this one will be pretty different. Um... Persephone, Persephone, Persephone. Persephone. Yeah. Oh, also, when I mention this, I'm also using a pronunciation I normally don't use. I normally go for the classical Roman time period one because um, speaking Latin and ancient Greek on a regular basis, I kind of mentally that kind of makes more sense to me. So, but thankfully, I am, for the most part, accurately and instantaneously uh, remembering my fifth century BC pronunciations. It's not that different. <laughs> So, I hope it's not too much of a struggle for you. I'm just, I'm giving oh, the opportunity to practice. Are you kidding? <laughs> this, is, this is what I do. I love this. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And so yeah. here's another one for you. He is the god of oceans and underwater springs and earthquakes. Again, that sort of thonic uh kind of theme running through it. I'd say Poseidon, like Poseidon Adventure, that cheesy 70s movie. But you might say in ancient Greece... Poseidon, Poseidon, Poseidon. Poseidon. Yeah, the Epsilon Iota, uh, Epsilon Iota, which I, uh, I've had a video about that and how. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's the, the sound of it is a high closed E, something like Italian vero or um, he and Dutch or other languages, E. And then it closes the E by the end of that classical period. Uh, so Pose, Poseidon. Poseidon would be heard certainly by Alexander the Great's time. Cool. Yeah. This is this is awesome. Okay, so another video game character slid in here. He is another aspect of the god of wine and represents something the god of blood and rebirth. But in the very popular awesome game Hades, which everyone should play, I'd say Zagreus, but the ancient Greeks might say. Oh, that's, well, let's check the spelling. I, I'm, I would say Zagri. It had to be Zagreus. Actually, I, so I don't need to. It's Z A G R E U S. Oh, Zagreus. Okay, that's, that's different. Zagreus. 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 
I love it put you on the spot and you still came through with flying colors. That's really amazing. <laughs> I mean, maybe I did. I think I did, but <laughs> it sounds right to me. It's 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 all Greek to me anyway. Dun, dun, sh okay. Um, and then finally, we're going to end on a strong note with the king of the gods. Now, I think you had a video about how his name also kind of evolved over time. And there are a couple of different ways to say this. Mm. But in American English, uh, I'd say Zeus. Mm. But in ancient Greece, when they're at the altar and they're doing sacrifices at dawn, oh they might be praying to... Zeus. 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 And well, this probably requires some discussion. Um, so, uh, the letter, but we read Z, Zeta, or Z if we're Canadian or British. Um, the, uh, that letter Zeta, its pronunciation, depending on the century, there is still not absolute clarity. Now, the, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I just find that really interesting. I'm like, wow, I did not realize that. I didn't realize how well, complicated it was. Well, I used to be quite certain about it until I um, discussed a lot of these things with my uh, uh, linguistic friend, um, uh, linguist friend, uh, Rafael Torrejano. He's maybe seen him in some of my videos. Awesome guy and super knowledgeable. So here's the thing. Um, Zeus, in particular, um, this name comes from the same origin as in the uh, beginning of the word uh, Jupiter, which is, it's you, right? Jupiter. Jupiter is you pater. What is this you from? This you is from a proto indo proto -Indo european is the parent language of Latin and, and Greek, um, or proto italic and Hellenic more accurately, but ultimately comes from proto indo european So the you is originally from a proto indo european du, du. Now du is a little bit more familiar sounding when we compare it to the oblique, the non nominative, the non ga Japanese ga form of the name of Zeus, it's the possessive form. So like um, Zeus no would be Dios. Dios. So there's Zeus when he's just Zeus doing stuff, but it's Dios if it's of Zeus. And there's others like Dia when you're talking some, some way about him. So it's different. So Dia, Dios. And then Diu is the origin of Jupiter, of Jupiter. So what this part, this Diu, Dia, is basically like saying the Latin name Jupiter is almost like Zeus, Pater, Father. God name, whatever it is, Zeus, you, Diu, the Father. Um, the, so, okay, that's interesting. The oblique forms, which have this dio, dia, di, and so forth in, in ancient Greek, more clearly, more clearly demonstrate that. So, it, in those forms, it's not dia, it's dia, or dio. It's like more than one syllable. So we have a, a dia from Proto-Indo-European, which, um, dissimilates into the ya. To like dia, so the the yeah, the the um, what am I saying? Yeah, dio. So the it becomes like its own vowel syllable, not a consonant ya sound. Okay, so that's the first thing that happens. And the consequence. So modern Greek is za. It's very similar to a za. It's just retracted za. And in the classical Roman time, it was a geminated za sound. It was long because if you have a da plus a ya, it's going to end up um, simplifying to a long version sound. All that makes sense. Here's the problem. There are words like um, Athenas or, Athen or um, Athenas. Athenas is Athens. De means towards. So Athenas de, towards Athens. Athenas de, Athenas de. But it's written with just a zeta, which means that zeta must mean zeta. Okay, it means zeta. But Zeus is from Diu or Dios or something like that. So it's from Dia. So Dia becomes Zda. <laughs> that means a metathesis of the Ya and the Da parts. The problem with that is that you have an affricate Zda, which metathesizes to Zda. So some people would say, like Sidney Allen, who researched this back in the 20th century, back in he said uh, that it should be zda, like so it should be zdeus, zdeus, and not zeus, which is another possibility. The pro and then we have transcriptions in languages like Persian, which demonstrate, oh yeah, it should be zza, zza. But we have a whole bunch of other transcriptions which make it seem like it should be zza, and we have plenty which make it seem like it should be just a simple zza, even in the fifth century. This is one of the reasons I don't use the fifth century reconstructed pronunciation because that letter is super frequent and it is 
very unclear how it ought to be pronounced. Should it be always the same in every position? Would you make it different for Zeus, but the other way for the Athena's there towards Athens? And it's, whereas if you just go well, a century or two later, it's utterly clear how it's pronounced because we have Latin to compare it with. And the Latin transcriptions show you exactly, you know, we, we know Latin phonology um, much better because you have two, even you have, they're both through two moving targets. Um, but instead of just one moving target, it's a lot easier to um, corroborate because you have two living languages, which are both used for literature and both of them are transcribing constantly from one language to the other. So it's, it's that's why I prefer the pronunciation a system I developed with the same Raphael Torrigiano I mentioned before, which I, which called Lucian pronunciation after the author Lucian from the second century AD, um, because it's just w way more certain that that's an actual way Greek sounded as opposed to is it zda or za or za in the fifth century BC? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but Luke, I can't make this easy for you. We got to have a challenge. You got to do fifth century. Greek is BC. easy for no one. Do you see my Greek gotcha <laughs> video? No, I haven't watched it yet. It came. It actually came up uh, last night, late last night, okay. when I was putting together my notes for this. I was like, I am going to watch that later. It is all sarcastic. It's all. <laughs> I'm sensing it might be. <laughs> it's and that's part of it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, let's um, move on to something quote unquote easier. Now, this is interesting because okay. some of these names, you know, if we're talking about the Iliad and the Odyssey, we're talking very you know, 8th century BCE. We're just, we're going to make this way easier for you by going backwards in time because we've got some real tongue twisters. And this one is for those who, like me, if you were in high school or college and you were required to take certain classes. So it was a requirement for me to take Greek seminar in uh, my small liberal arts college. It ended up being my favorite class. I love, awesome. love, loved it. But going through the names of the Iliad, I just have a small handful of the biggest tongue twisters and the most famous names because you take a look at them and sometimes you'll have professors who can't agree on how to quite pronounce these names, making it even harder to figure out what am I doing with these names. <laughs> so we're going to start with um, someone who is quote unquote heroic, although he spends most of the Iliad pouting and sulking in his tent. I would say Achilles. What do you think uh, this one would be? And you can use whatever whatever yeah, Greek Achilles. is Hold probably easiest because this one's a hard one. Yeah, um, Achilles, uh, which is not actually not that, that part, but there's some spelling variations depending on if it's Homer or um, uh, classical Attic, because it's um, the the uh, that's um, Achilles is the st standardized spelling and pronunciation if it's Attic. So um, Achilleos. So there we have a K, but it's um, the letter Chi, so it makes a has an aspiration on it. So it's not merely uh, Achilleos, but Achilleos, Achilleos, Achilleos. Yep, that is definitely different from what I learned in school. <laughs> yeah, but that's not surprising considering it's almost three thousand years of you know history separating me from all these Greek heroes. Now he did not like our next king of, uh, we say Mycenae, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well, but he also wasn't liked by his wife either, it turns out. I would say Agamemnon. What do you think that might sound like in Homer and then classical Greek? Agamemnon would be pretty much the same for mo both of them, I think. Okay, Agamemnon. so that one's, that one's pretty Yeah, some vowel, yeah, some opener, closer, vowels, yeah. This one has always been hard for me to tell how to say it. Is it uh, his wife, Clytemnestra, or Clytemnestra, or how would you say that? I name? always heard Clytemnestra in English. Clytemnestra, uh, Clytemnestra, uh, I think is that's the spelling. Uh, Clytemnestra, I think I'm getting that right. Clytemnestra. Of course, I'm not seeing these, so I'm trying to remember how they're spelled. Uh, Clytemnestra. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I yeah. can put. You know, I should put be putting these in the chat so you can see them. I think that You're would be welcome easier. to do so. Uh, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Kutai Nestra. Kutai Nestra. So sorry, everyone. I botched That's... that one. But, yeah. <laughs> no, um, you, 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 you caught, you got it in the second, the second half. Yeah. It's totally fine. It's way better than I could do. Um, Kutai uh, Nestra. Okay. One more mm -hmm. time. Kutai uh, Nestra. Kritai Nestra. Okay. Nice. Yeah, that one has always been a tongue twister for me. So I wanted to get that one in. Um, but I accidentally skipped over a name that starts with A. This name is famous throughout history. It's actually one of my favorite names ever. 
Um, but he's also the prince who stole the Queen of Sparta. Now, we say Alexander in modern English. I think the Greeks might say Alexandros. And the Hittites apparently did have a Trojan prince, or they wrote about a Trojan prince named Alexandu, if I've got that mm -hmm. history correct. But we might say Alexandros, but what was this prince of Troy's name? Alexandros. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Paris. We're talking about Paris or Alexandros. Yeah. Either name yeah. is super cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Paris. Paris and um, Alexandros. Alexandros. Pitch accent on the Alexandros. Alexandros. The well, that makes that name even cooler. Yeah, Alexandros. Suppose. Perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. And is Helen just Helen or is there anything else to this name? Helene. Helene. And I'll, I'll go ahead and write it in the Greek. Helene. There she is. Helene. 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 Of course, in Doric, it's Helena. <laughs> Helena. Yeah, right, because they have that. They have that. Yeah. Uh, this one I love because the history behind this name is interesting. The meaning of it is interesting. But uh, it, we got the Latin Hercules. But is it Heracles? Is that Iracles? And either way, it means to the glory of Hera, which I find ironic. But right. how would we like Cleopatra it? also. Uh, Father glory. Yeah, I, I, yeah, a lot of people don't know that, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of these names are super cool. I was going to ask you about Cleopatra later, actually, <laughs> because that is also a popular uh, Greek name, it's even awesome though name. people don't realize that. It's a very awesome hmm. name. Is this Heracles? Heracles? Uh, Heracles, uh, for an Attic pronunciation, classical Attic, Heracles. Uh, yeah, so interestingly, so the contact, I don't actually know enough about mythology to comment on this intelligently enough, but prior to direct involvement of classical Greek civilization adopted by Roman civilization, there was a lot of um, mythology from Greek stuff which was getting into Roman society at a very early stage. In fact, uh, the um, Roman historian Livy talks about like from the beginning of, you know, Roman history um, going uh, all the way through the, all these mythology. I mean, it's not really history. It's from like mythology and legend and so forth. It mentions Heracles or Hercules as a very important part. So basically, um, Hercules, which is a Latin name, Hercules, is derived from essentially a different dialect of Greek from a different time period, and thus Hercules, as we say and pronounce it in English. I mean, so many of these Greek names are filtered through Latin and through the transformations that happen in Latin pronunciation, going towards Romance um, pronunciations through the Roman Empire. So, like, um, that's why it's it's Clyte, it's uh, Clytemnestra, not Clytemnestra or something, even though it's AI, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, people who might insist it's Heracles and not Hercules, I mean, in what context? The Romans were all saying Hercules, but they also, a lot of them spoke Greek, then know it's Heracles in the contemporary Greek. So, I'm just, um, it's a little bit like, what's a good example? Oh, I had an example, but I lost it. That doesn't matter. Well, it's yeah. it's still, it's still a cool story about mm. how like it's filtered from Greek to Latin and then it makes it into the Romance languages and then it just sort of hops around until we get mm -hmm. to the English Hercules, which is also a fantastic Disney movie. It so, is. I, I love, love that movie. movie. It's great. <laughs> and I'm Megara, right? Am I remembering her name? Yeah. So yeah, that's so close yeah, to your name. Yeah, so it's very yeah. close to my name, and I like her. I like her sass, Megara. Yeah. My friends call me Meg. They would at least if I had any friends. <laughs> just I love that line, which I probably just butchered. But it's been a while since I've seen that movie. But yeah, oh, you just that. call me Meg. <laughs> it's just easier that way. But it is also close to the name of a Furies. So I just did a History and Games podcast on the history of the Furies. Because mm. in a video game called Hades, they you come across them again and again and again. So you've got um, Meg, you've got Tisiphone, or Tisiphone, mm -hmm. I'm not sure which it is, and Electo. And it's interesting because in ancient Greece, they didn't think of them as a group of three. They never really mentioned how many there are. And it's not until, and this is where we get into the weeds a little bit, but it's not until either Virgil or the Orphic Hymns or... Mm. Um, the Biblioteca de la Biblioteca, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but somewhere Those in there right. where we start to get three Furies with names. 
So mm. I was That's looking awesome. for these names and I'm like, I hope I'm pronouncing these right. But I always say in my podcast, I'm like, look, I'm trying. Don't come after me. I'm trying to get these names right. But it's it's tough. No, just show them the Caesar rant video. <laughs> I There's, think I will. I think I'll, I think I'll, you know, my audience is actually pretty cool though. No one's gotten after me about it. I think they appreciate that I tried. Wait for the Greeks. They'll come after you. But then you just got to <laughs> say, I'm making a video to address that specific thing. That should be fun. The, uh, have you heard of um, Eumenides as an epithet of the Furies? Eumenides? Uh, yes, I have. Evmenides or something like Evmeni that. Uh, Ev Evmenides. Or Ev yeah, Evmenides uh, for modern Greek pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Evmenides. Excellent. And uh, the El, uh, El Menides, the um, which means the gracious ones, and it's this like um, it's almost like uh, um, what should we compare it to? It's an epithet that's meant to kind of euphemize Eo, meaning you like good, euphemize their um, their horrible or their da their danger, not they're not horrible per se, but they're dangerous. So the oh the oh gracious ones, don't. You know, yes, cut I'm, the I'm trying of my to appease life. you, right? Like these underworld yeah. beings, I'm trying to appease you. I'm going to direct you at, at that video as soon as I finish it. I'm almost finished, and then you can tell me how my Greek pronunciation is and, and what you think oh, of these very good. scary beings with a very, very long history because it goes way back to furious Demeter and all the reasons why she's angry and she has every right to be. So there's a little teaser for everybody. <laughs> have, you, have you seen any of the Pasqua y Rothri, um music videos? No, I haven't. You, you're going to love these. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a big channel with a lot of followers. But what they do is they take all of these Greek myths and they make music videos. The visuals are in the style of anime theme songs. And so is the, the, the music. Taken from different time periods, imitating like when you, but the original melodies, like imitating Whitney Houston, imitating all these. It's and they have for Zeus, for Hestia, for all, pretty much everyone we talked about today. Oh my for gosh, Hercules, How the I Hercules not one know is about really this? good. I didn't okay. know about it either until recently. It's a huge. They, I, so I, on Scorpio Martianos, I do these live streams with my great friend Chris Davis. He's a fluent Latin speaker like I am, but he doesn't know ancient Greek yet, or well, he hasn't until this this year. So since January, we've been every week or so, we've been. Doing using a textbook which involves these gods, we've been um, uh, learning about Zeus in sim simple, in relatively simple ancient Greek, and using Latin as our common language to talk about it. And we do that because we kind of feel feel like ancient Romans learning ancient Greek. You know, it's sort of the idea. And also, Latin and Greek are closer in a lot of ways. They're not related closely per se, but they're more similar. And the cultural intermixing of Greek and Latin is just sort of a part of that ancient world and it still remains a part of latin and ancient greek language literature culture to this day so it sort of makes a lot of sense for us to do it in latin but we also love the pasqua and the rodi and we also speak spanish and these videos are in spanish they're subtitled in english and they're hilarious and they just basically make fun and parody everything about the mythology they don't even have to make fun of it they basically just say the facts and with these anime style, anime style visuals they're hilarious we even play them and we uh, talk about them in the in the live stream. So they're pretty fun. All right, I need to go. I definitely need to go check that yeah. out because that sounds that sounds amazing. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a couple more uh, mm. heroes at you real fast just to just to cover our bases mm. here. Um, this one is also kind of a tongue twister if you if you've never heard it. Most people have, but it it's the spelling is really interesting. So I might say the wily. Uh, King of Ithaca, Odysseus. What do you think Odysseus's name would sound like? Odysseus. 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 Yeah. Which becomes, interestingly, we don't say Ulysses very much anymore. No, we don't. Yeah. It, which is based on Latin name Ulysses. That's another example like Hercules, a figure so important and legendary that the... Because the, the Greek names and the spellings that we're all using are essentially the standardized versions from Athens from the 5th century BC. But we have all these different Greek dialects, languages per se, perhaps, going back from at least Homer's time that are all, I mean, the, they were colonizing southern Italy for hundreds of, of years before that standardized version of the language appears. It's almost like um, becoming, being critical, or not even critical per se, but pointing out the obvious differences of American English from modern RP, the received pronunciation of, of English. As if it's like we speak a dialect that's different with our accent. When in reality, both RP and American English are both descended from a common origin, which is essentially Shakespeare's time. And they, 
Shakespeare's pronunciation had stuff in common with both British English as well as American English. So that said, um, Ulixes was derived from some alternate pronunciation version of Odysseus. Odysseus is just closer to the Attic pronunciation of the 5th century BC. Ulixes is what some Romans heard like hundreds of years earlier from a completely different dialect of Greek. That's also the different reason why we have uh, an alphabet, an Roman alphabet, that's different looking than the standard Greek one, because there were lots of Greek alphabets. And that's where it, it came from, a different Greek, a Western Greek alphabet instead of an Eastern, uh, the Ionic Greek alphabet, which is the standard Greek alphabet. That is really cool. That is that is a really interesting piece of history, knowing that explains an awful lot, by the way. So, <laughs> but we are going to, I'm going to be really mean right now, and I'm going to drag you back to the 5th century BCE, which is my love favorite it. time for an ancient no, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're going to tackle, for a lot of people, these names are also difficult. We're going to tackle some historical figures like philosophers, playwrights, war leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to start again in alphabetical order with a playwright who was very big on drama. He also lived through some drama. He lived through the Persian Wars and fought at the Battle of Salamis. And I'm not really sure. I've never been clear about what the correct English pronunciation is because I've heard a couple of different things. But if I said Aeschylus, Aeschylus, what do you think the pronunciation yeah. 5th century BCE would be for this for this uh, playwright? Well, Aeschylus is totally fine for the English pronunciation. Aeschylus, that's the, the normal one there. Um, and let me just check where the, yeah, it's, um, where the pitch accent is. Aeschylus, 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 with a K, Aeschylus. With a K. So it's not yeah. an sound, like it, it is Aeschylus or something like that. It is in other, hold on, yeah, at least some, so people are interested, if you go to lucraniari.com, at the bottom, I have spreadsheets where I basically show every attested transformation over hundreds of years, about a thousand years, for both Latin and ancient Greek. Um... And I'm trying to remember when there's a good evidence of ch instead of k. You get some clear possible evidence, at least by the first century BC Roman times, where we have aeschylos, which is the same as the modern, more or less the same as the modern pronunciation, which is eschylos. Um, so yeah, there you go. So the k, that's the aspirated consonant, which was typical of the Attic pronunciation of fifth century BC. Say it one more time for me. Aeschylos. Aeschylos. Mm-hmm. All right, and then we're going to, this one was a request because not only is this a famous war leader from the end of the 5th century BCE, but he is a prominent character in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It looks like Alcibiades, but is that even remotely close? Hold on, yeah. Um, there we go. Yeah, that sounded great. Uh, Alcibiades is the modern Greek pronunciation. Yeah, um, Alcibiades, Alcibiades. Al Alcibiades for 5th century BC. Alcibiades. Alcibiades. Okay. Yeah. And then this particular leader is extremely popular. He's all over pop culture. He's in movies and video games. Um, you can either say Leonidas. I always say Leonidas. But in 5th century Sparta, they would refer to this Agid king as? Leonidas. 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 Yeah. Oh, your picture accents. Knowing Japanese is why you sound so good for sure. Because <laughs> uh, you got all the all the picture accents, pitch accents have sounded perfect. Um, uh, it, it, the pitch accent, unlike Japanese, at least they mark pitch accent in Greek. Leonidas, and the as ending is also typical of Doric, where the letter eta e is normally a in Doric, which is like um, uh, what was one example we were talking about earlier with an a? Uh, can't remember now. We had a, a good one, um, but. Um, Anyway, so yeah, um, es, uh, Leonides would be the Attic ending, es, like uh, Alcibiades, whereas the Doric version of that would be Alcibiad Alcibiadas. Right, so, so, uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm not too far off if I say Leonidas. I mean, it's perfect. So. Oh, okay, and it's not, and, yeah. just to, and just to be clear, it's not, it's not yet a the sound, it's still kind of a duh. Well. Sort of. uh, with Doric, I'm trying to remember where there is evidence of the delta changing in Boeotian, if I'm not mistaken, rather early, um, where they start. There's the word dia, which means 
for or through um, like the ati, which means per que or por que in Spanish means why the ati um, uh, for what it's literally the exact same thing as por que or per que in Italian. Um, so dia is written as with a zeta in I forget which dialect, even in the contemporary classical period, but not in Attica, not in Athens, as za or zia. And it's supposed that what this is trying to describe is the sound of via, but that's the only letter that they had to try to explain it. So via, kind of like with uh, the, um, what, uh, like uh, Athene, um, a Doric person would have said like um, Athena, or they'd be written with the letter S, like a right. sigma, but it would mean th, Athena, that kind of, that's right. Yeah, you, that's why I brought it up just to clarify because you had mentioned that yeah. earlier, and it's just like you know, I want to make sure that I'm I'm getting this. This is important. If I you know fall into a time warp and I end up in fifth century Sparta, I wanna I want to make sure that my my door. You don't want to sound Athenian. <laughs> no, They'll you get do you. not. <laughs> not They'll during the Peloponnesian War. Anything past 450 BCE, I'm, I'm asking for but, trouble. And even a little. It is bit like talking then. like Boris and Natasha in fifties fifties <laughs> United States Kansas. <laughs> Very dangerous. Yes, very Not dangerous. recommend. <laughs> yeah. That was a very good example. <laughs> now I guess I'm laughing. Okay, well, we're going to stay in Sparta for a bit because Got this off. is the name of a, of a very famous geographer, but way before that, this is also the, uh, the person who won the victory at the Battle of Plataea, but was Leonidas's very controversial nephew. Is it Pausanias? Right. Uh, Pausanias. 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 Very good. Pausanias. Pausanias. And would you, would, so you wouldn't say Pausanias, you would say Pausanias. You would, you would separate. I'm pretty them. sure the pitch accents on the iota, but now I'm going to check how Pausanias. Um, so, yeah, I, I keep saying Pausanias, Pausanias, but I want to make sure that's right. Mm -hmm. Pausanias. Pausanias. And it's a uh, high pitch on the iota, but it's a short vowel. And then the long vowel was follow. So, Pausanias, Pausanias. Pausanias. All right. So, we're going to move on to Athens. So, we're going to leave Sparta for a second. And we're going to name two very famous people from Athens. One uh, is the architect of the Athenian navy. He is my favorite uh, real historical figure from ancient Greece because he has a lot of parallels with Churchill, both good and bad. I've always said, Themistocles, Themistocles, which means glory of the law, but what should I actually be saying? I want to make sure I, I get the right pitch accent um, on uh, Themistocles. Themisto, themi yep, so on uh, an acute accent on the last one. So like sensei, um, Themistocles, Themistocles. Themistocles. Yeah, so it's, I'm not, also, it's not a hmm? the, it's a, more of like a te sound. Be the and Doric, apparently, um, and be the by a few centuries later. Um, so some dialects would have it. Doric seems to be one of them, best as we can tell. And definitely at some point later, like um, there's some inscriptions in some Jewish catacombs in the first century AD in Rome, which demonstrate, I think, that exact sound change. Hmm. So, but how would, but just to be clear, how would Themistocles himself say his name? Because he'd want I'm his name sure said say, right. I think he would say, um, um, uh, Themistocles, Themistocles. With that Themistocles. T Themistocles. Themistocles. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Themistocles. good, good. So when I, when yeah. I travel back in time, I'll get that one. I'll get that one right. <laughs> so that Malista, is, of course. Yeah, yeah. So um, they have one. I have one more. This is a uh, this is a request that came in late, so it's kind of at the end of my notes. But I actually like this one because if you're an anime fan, we're gonna actually take this one back to Homer. And if you know a movie, Naushka Valley of the Wind, if you if I say Naushka, how do you think it would be pronounced in Greek? Naushka, yeah, Naushka, Naushka. Yeah, Nausicaa. at the double alpha, Nausicaa, and then another alpha, which is long, which follows. Nausicaa, uh, Nausicaa, Nausicaa, yeah, Nausicaa. Nausicaa. <laughs> that's, that's very pretty, too. I like that. So I think I've gone through all of the, the Greek names, um, and I think, let's see, what time are we at here? Because I don't want to... 
I don't want to keep you too long. We can always do another interview and tackle everything fun. Latin, <laughs> which is a whole. Yeah, you want to do another one? That would be great. Yeah, if we could set up like another one for another day and then just go through some cool Latin stuff. Yeah, that's fun. And it gives me more opportunities to, of course, I'm going to put this video on the my channel pages, channel tabs on my, my cha channels and um, around other places, yes. Instagram and places. So more, yeah. I think it would be great for both of us. Yes, it'll yeah. be, it'll be fun.